us pray with confidence as Christ our Lord has asked. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. O God, who have commanded us to listen to your beloved Son, be pleased, we pray, to nourish us inwardly by your word, that with spiritual sight made pure, we may rejoice to behold your glory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. May Almighty God bless you and remain with you always, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Amen. Amen. This evening, as we are meditating upon the Word of God, the passage is uh, chapter 9 of the Acts of the Apostles. And it is certainly one that speaks to us of the new evangelization because it speaks to us of the great evangelizer, St. Paul, who was uh, turned from a path in which he was working against the will of God and to one in which he became, he used all those great talents which he had in persecuting and uh, the zeal he had in that to be transformed by the Lord to be the one who is the apostle to the Gentiles. And so St. Paul is certainly a, a saint and apostle of the new evangelization. And as we reflect upon this passage from the Acts of the Apostles, we recognize how important this experience of the conversion of St. Paul is uh, within his own life. And it is certainly something that St. Luke uh, reflects on a couple of times. See, there are actually in the Acts of the Apostles three different accounts of the conversion of St. Paul. And there's another one by St. Paul himself in Galatians. So we have four different accounts of this uh, moment on the road to Damascus when the great persecutor became uh, the great uh, evangelist and apostle to the nations. And so as we meditate upon these words of the Lord in the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 9, verses 1 to 22, 
it's good for each of us to look deeply into our own hearts. Uh, we're not the level of Paul. We have a more limited scope, perhaps. But where we are, we're called to have that fire, that zeal, that sword of St. Paul to launch forth and uh, join in the great romantic adventure of the proclaiming of the Word of God. So let us now begin with a, a time of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now let go of any of those cares and concerns that can so often distract us and take away our ability to be attentive to God's word, whether it be the worries that consume us, and which perhaps speak to us of our lack of trust in God, or whether it be the various sins which provide a, a blockage in our hearts so that the Lord does not have a pathway to our hearts. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he journeyed, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and took food and was strengthened. For several days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And in the synagogues immediately he proclaimed Jesus, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called on this name? And he has come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Let's just spend some time and quietly reflecting upon the conversion of St. Paul. What single message does it give to us in our own lives? A 
of how we must serve the Lord and respond to his call when he calls each one of us. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Saul is breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Murder. And yet he is the one who is given the great mission of being a chosen instrument of God. Each one of us in our own way is very frail and inadequate, and yet we have probably not turned away from the Lord as much as Saul. And yet this is the one the Lord chooses. He is the one to be an instrument of God's grace, because none of us initiates any work of evangelization it is the Lord who chooses those whom he may use in the great mission. And he saw in Saul the potential for being one who used the zeal and energy that had been turned against the disciples to be used for the glory of God. But Saul, is certainly not someone you would point out as having a vocation to apostleship. And maybe the Lord chooses people and each one of us in different ways in our own frailty so that we don't become proud, so that we recognize that we are all sinners in need of God's mercy. But surely Saul did as he became transformed into Paul the apostle. He constantly was aware, even in his moments of great success, that he was the greatest of sinners. And that's the starting point. And on this Lenten day, we should be attentive to that as well. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus. He's a very well-organized persecutor thinking ahead, planning. If he can get some letters to go there, he can expand the persecution. Very good to have someone who's thinking ahead. This is a talent, an organizational ability. And that's just what the Lord used to spread the gospel to the farthest ends of the earth. In Saul the persecutor, it increased the effectiveness of persecution. And Paul the Apostle, that same human talent for initiative and organization, knowing how to plan an operation, that is used to bring the light of Christ to those who did not have it. It can go either way. You think of two great orators with a great ability to speak, Churchill and Hitler, both with great talent, used differently. It is the way in which it is directed by God's grace that the talent is either fruitful or destructive. As it is, it is simply there. And so we look to that and we look to the different things we have in our own lives, our own abilities, whatever they may be, and we can use them for good or ill. It's just like they often say, you know, the worst thing in the world, it's not an uncharitable remark. The thing that's much worse is an uncharitable remark that is witty because it sticks and hurts more. The power of language can bring good or ill. And so does the power of organization that Paul, Saul shows here. So let's just ask the Lord, how are the gifts that you have given me, how am I using them? How can I use whatever talents I have more for good than for ill? 
And how have I used sometimes great talents I have to do not good, but wrong, the way Saul did before his conversion? And if so, let us ask God's mercy for that. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Here we have one of the earliest uh, names for our faith, the way. The way, the journey, the path. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way to the heavenly Father. He is the path. He is the guide along that path. But the disciples of the Lord among themselves spoke of their life as the way, the way that leads to life and light, not to death, darkness. Although we have that choice in that famous opening line of the teaching of the 12 apostles, there are two ways the way to life and the way to death, and there is a great difference between them. And so these are people who followed the way. They had direction in their lives. And that's true of us to this day. You know, we are Christians. We, we have many questions because the mysteries of God are infinite, and we have many questions too, even in this life, because all of the cares and troubles we face are very often complicated and hard. But we know the way who is Jesus. We have questions, but we also have answers. We're not just blundering around in the fog. And it's important for us, especially during this Lenten season, to become more still within our own hearts, to let the distractions and all that shrubbery of our own ego be cleared away so that we can be more attentive to the way and to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, and not be caught up in all those little pathways that lead us nowhere. Or we can become like Dante at the very beginning of the greatest of all poems, halfway through the journey of our life, I found myself lost, for I had lost the way. Now as he journeyed, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise, enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Now as he journeyed, full of threats and murder and eager and well-organized persecutions and things like that, no doubt thinking of the next move in his plan. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. God breaks into his life as God breaks into your life and mine in so many different ways, perhaps not as dramatic as this, but Saul was a hard nut to crack, so... He did great things. He was going to be a great apostle, but he needed a great shock. Probably, you know, for the rest of us, we're not going to do as great things as Paul did. So the ways the Lord may knock, knock at the door may be perhaps for us a little more gentle, subtle. But he needed the flash of light, and that always we see in the sacred scriptures is a sign of the, the presence of the Lord, the great flash of light. And so suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him, and he fell to the ground. That's a good start. Get off your high horse. It helps. Fall to the ground. Get a little humus, humility. Any one of us, even if we don't get the flash of light, we need the, the ground. We need to be grounded. He fell to the ground. And he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? The voice calls him by name. 
We've heard that before. Remember in the temple of the Lord in the Old Testament, Samuel, Samuel. And finally, Samuel replies, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. In the gospel today, we hear Abraham. Here I am, says Abraham. We're called by name. We're not in some kind of a relationship with the force of the universe. It is the Lord of might and power who knows each one of us by name. And we should try that too. Not that we necessarily can remember people's names, that's a difficult thing. But that we should know people by name as much as possible in the sense of treating them as a person. So here are the great persecutors coming along and after the Lord blows him off his horse, he gets him down on the ground where he's a little bit grounded there. He then says, Saul, he knows him, he's watched him, he's followed him, he's followed his persecuting career. He says, Saul, Saul. He doesn't say, you're gonna go to hell. I mean, that would be a logical thing for God to say. Maybe a little briskness there. No, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He just opens up the question. And maybe that's a lesson for us to follow the example of the Lord in dealing with the hard-hearted Saul to, in our effort to be faithful disciples and apostles, to lead more with questions rather than with threats or imperatives. Say, Saul, Saul, well, why do you persecute me? We all need to work that way, to question, to reflect, to try to understand more. And when we see someone who is apparently doing something horrible, we don't know why, because we can't read their hearts and we shouldn't try, maybe it's good to start with, why are you doing that? And you notice what he says? He doesn't say, why are you persecuting the church? He says, why are you persecuting me? It's one of the great statements of all history about the meaning of who we are. We are one body, one body in Christ, and we do not stand alone. It is the mystical body of Christ. It is, as Jesus says, me. We are the me he's talking about. We're all joined to the Lord Jesus. And so when Saul was persecuting the Christians, those following the way, he was persecuting Jesus. And when we in our own little ways, uh, you see it locally, you know, parish pump politics and stuff like that, you know, we can always be fighting the brethren. And uh, isn't it true how often Christians can be so negative to one another. And the Lord can say to us, as he said to Saul, parishioner, parishioner, or priest, priest, or heaven knows even wherever, at whatever level of the church. If you're lobbing grenades at one another in various ways, <laughs> why are you persecuting me? Every time we stick it to somebody, we're persecuting our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, he says, whatever you do to the least of my brothers and sisters, you do to me. And here he says it a somewhat different way. Let's think about that for a moment and ask the Lord's forgiveness when on, in other ways we have persecuted Christ by our lack of charity to other people. And he said, who are you, Lord? Which is a bit odd, because he seemed to know who he was. Who are you, Lord? Of course, he, do, he knew a little bit. He was seeing a vision. He was seeing this profound experience of the risen Lord. Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. 
but arise, enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Now there's another good start for a life of holiness. Instead of him racing along with his horse, going in there to persecute the people of there, he was a very much breathing threats and all that and organizing plans. He was very much in charge. I sort of suspect that Saul was someone who told other people what to do. I think he was a tolder rather than a toldee. You know, one of these high energy types, type A personality, sort of, uh, there we go. But now he says, our Lord Jesus, the Lord says to him, rise, enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. So check your ego at the door. You're gonna now be directed. This is why in the religious life and uh, all of us in different ways, obedience is one of the most fruitful of all the commitments we make. It's made by everyone in different ways, sometimes formally by vows, sometimes not. It's made within the sacrament of ordination. It's made within the sacrament of marriage as well and of baptism and confirmation, and of course, in religious profession. You will be told what you're to do. Don't let your, your own ego take over. We need to let go a bit and surrender to God's will and also accommodate as well to the will of others or we are going to become simply caught up in ourselves and then we implode. And so there he is, now no longer in charge. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Isn't that something now? He could see nothing. When before, just moments before, he could see the Lord. He's going to have a time now where he can see nothing. And he has to be led by the hand into Damascus. He has to become a child again. And he has to just let go of his own ego before he is going to be purified enough to have all those great talents that were within him redirected to be fruitful and not destructive. But first the seed must die before it can bring new life. And that's true for Saul and it's true for you and me. We gotta be led by the hand a little bit there now. And this season of Lent is the time for us to think about that. Let go of all of our ego-driven plans. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Fasting, a time of purification, a time of dependence on other people. That's the hardest thing of all, dependence. In a time when he was not in control, for three days, he was helpless. At the time of his life when he was most being helped, he himself was helpless. And the Lord could have simply, you know, fixed him up after three days and set him on his way again as the great apostle Paul. But instead, it's interesting that the Lord God works through the rest of us. Not always in great flashes of light from heaven. He, he had to do that a bit at first to kind of get some sense into Paul's skull there, you know. Paul needed that jolt. But once he had got that working and Paul was reduced to the appropriate level of recognition of humility, the normal way that the Lord God works is not through flashes of light, but through us and what our neighbors. There's nobody as obscure as Ananias. We don't know where he came from and we never hear of him again. Ananias is just local Christian of Damascus. And God invites him 
to be the instrument of his choice, to be the way through whom Paul, the great instrument of salvation, is brought to Christ. He uses one of the parishioners to help this stranger who is going through the most profound experience of his life. And this is what he does all the time. This is the normal way. We have the unusual way of the horse blasting light, that kind of thing. That's unusual, but it's necessary occasionally. But the normal way is people like Ananias. There was a disciple of Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. Now there, isn't that beautiful? Again, the Lord calls him by name. And he knows about even Ananias. We can assume he knows about Saul. He's such a spectacular character. Going to be Paul the Apostle. But he also knows about Ananias, an obscure parishioner of Damascus, who we never hear of again, but who is loved by the Lord just as much as he loves Paul. And he knows him by name too. He says, Ananias. And Ananias gives the right answer that we need to give all the time. The one Abraham gives in the first, in the first reading this morning. Here I am, Lord. Hine, here I am, Lord. It's the answer our Blessed Mother gives too. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. It's what Samuel gives. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Here I am, Lord. We can live our life on those words. Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight and inquire in the house of Judas for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Ananias needs detailed instructions, as do we all. So he's going to get him set. You know, Ananias is not a you know, heavy-duty apostle. He's just working along there. He's, he's a saint. He says, here I am, Lord. And the Lord gives him the directions of how to fulfill this incredibly important task in the whole history of salvation, to be the one through whom the great apostle Paul is purified and brought back. And that's that beautiful role that Ananias has. And, and the Lord helps him. He gives him directions. I think we sometimes forget about that, that uh, you know, we're thinking of all the troubles we face and all that. And, Oh my, it's so easy to think, what am I going to do? Oh dear. And how will I find the way? But the Lord will give us directions as he gave Ananias, even telling him what street to go down to find. It's so easy to forget that. I don't know about you, but I often find it very hard, you know, you, you can so often get not trusting enough in the hand of God and too worried that our own efforts are gonna mess everything up. And we get, they may for that matter, because we're all kind of frail. But we gotta have the spirit of Ananias. Say, here I am, Lord, then take instructions. And then humbly follow that. And Ananias is also um, not just putty in the hands of the Lord in the sense that God uses disciples to do his will, but he expects them to be thinking disciples, like Paul, for that matter. So just as he chose a very talented persecutor to be one of his great apostles, he chose Ananias, who isn't just blindly obedient, because Ananias says, having received this vision of God and this call to do this extraordinary thing, Ananias says, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call upon your name. And so Ananias has the temerity to say to the Lord, you've got to be kidding. You really want me to go to this? You know, he's filling the Lord in on some of the details of the problem. It's just kind of nice. But the Lord said to him, go, 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 go. For he is this wonderful thing, this chosen instrument. He's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles 
and the kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Isn't that interesting? As he's sort of chatting with Ananias, getting him ready for the big mission in his life, he says, you know, you're right, you know, he is the persecutor, but he's a chosen instrument. And that's why I want you to help him out. But then he says something very special. He says that Saul will become this great apostle to the Gentiles, the chosen instrument. And the thing that defines Paul's future mission is not that he's going to convert the world, but it's, I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. It's like the sword that will pierce the heart of the Blessed Virgin. It is the reality of the cross and the first sign that the Lord mentions in talking with Ananias about Paul is the suffering he'll go through. You're gonna be going to a man who's gonna be suffering a lot, more than just this blindness that he's been given to help purify him. We should think about that. What our witness involves As Thomas More said, you don't get to heaven on feather beds. And sometimes, you know, we can kind of think that we do, but none of us. We all are called to share in some way in the cross of Christ. And uh, it may not be obvious, and it may take different forms. But it's in that that our vanity is purified and evaporated, and our own egos are made humble and made fruitful for the Lord. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has appeared to you on the road by which you came. He has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Brother Saul, Ananias really did listen. He's way ahead of Paul and Saul and that at this moment. Brother Saul. Let's just spend a moment asking the Lord to help us to see those perhaps that we are wary of in our lives. Or maybe we mock a little bit or maybe we're quite harsh in the way we speak about them, whether they be near or far. People we're as suspicious of as Ananias was suspicious of Saul. And can we say brother, sister to that person? The way Saint Ananias said to Saul the persecutor? Or are we likely just to be curt and sharp in the way we treat people we don't trust or we are suspicious of or we feel that we have been hurt by? And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and took food and was strengthened. Immediately, like that. Pretty well everything with Saul and Paul is immediate. It's the action of God. But it's through good old Ananias. The Lord works through a good and humble servant who then just drops out of sight and never heard of again, except by God. He's always Ananias, called by name. And I can imagine at the end of his life, he would hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master, Ananias. Saul rose and was baptized and then he sensibly took some food and got himself strengthened. This is like some of the great religious founders like Ignatius Loyola and others. 
they fasted a little too much at first, and then he got sensible and realized if you're going to do the work of the Lord, you're going to have to have a, you know, decent meal or so to keep you going. So after he had been purified, he took food and was strengthened, just like our Lord. Remember when he, um, you know, talith the kum, and he said, give her some food. Uh, that practicality is very real. We, we were sublimely touched by the Lord, but yeah, then he begins. And then, just as when Our Lady had the experience of God at the Annunciation, it immediately shifts into the visitation, moves out not just to experience the glory of God, but move forward. So now that Saul has been brought down to the ground, blinded, purified, brought back up by a fellow Christian who's a friend, a brother, and a sent, sent from the Lord. Now he's rising up, baptized, strengthened, and he doesn't just spend the time uh, praising the Lord. Well, he could do that, I'm sure he did inwardly, but for several days he was with the disciples at Damascus. That must have been rather awkward, I would imagine. Can you imagine certain lulls in the conversation? What have you been doing lately, Saul? Oh, <laughs> you know, it would be a little awkward, I'd imagine, for a while. <laughs> sort of, oh, <laughs> look who you brought for dinner. <laughs> Saul the persecutor. I mean, so anyway, there we are. But for several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus. I'm sure Ananias kind of smoothed the way. That, by the way, is kind of important, isn't it? That um, he didn't suddenly go off. He did immediately, very soon, the next verse goes off proclaiming the gospel. But between his purification, his conversion, and everything else, he spends a little time with the community. Remember later on he says that he checked out his teaching with the apostles to be sure he had it right? He was a fiery preacher, but he did not get drunk on his power. That's one of the classic temptations of religious figures, you know, to be kind of like a star. He did not. First of all, he fasted and he was brought by Ananias into the life of the Lord. But also, before launching forth, he spent some time with his fellow Christians. For several days, he was with the disciples at Damascus. Another thing he did, not mentioned here, he headed off to the desert, to Arabia for a while, to have a little quiet time of prayer. And another thing he did is he checked it out with the Pope to see what he was doing. That's very important. That's what Francis did too, you know. He was gonna be this great spiritual leader. First he checked with the bishop, then he checked with the Pope. It helps if you're not, you know, Lone Ranger, kind of flying high, super spiritual, you know, superstar. Look at how the Lord takes this bundle of talent and energy, brings him low, gets a very ordinary down-to-earth fellow Christian to be the instrument of his salvation, and then he gets a mix it in with the parishioners in Damascus to kind of to be sure that he's grounded so that he wouldn't become destructive to himself and others. But then, having been grounded enough, in the synagogues immediately, he proclaimed Jesus saying, he is the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called in this name? And he has come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. He proclaimed it and he proved it. He proclaimed it by just proclaiming it. But he also used that head of his, all that knowledge to argue for, to give reason for the hope he had, as St. Peter says in his letter. He was into apologetics. And we need to do that more. We don't just sort of believe kind of for the fun of it. We have, there's reason. We can prove, we don't prove, some ways, but we can give signs and 
use the mind the Lord gave us and the knowledge, the learning and all that in order to not just proclaim the Lord, but to speak with reason and faith together with the two wings with which we fly. Both of them gifts of God. And by this time, Saul is flying high. He's now launched and he will soon become the great apostle. The next bit, by the way, in case he got a little too cocky about his great success in Damascus, he has to get out of the city in a basket, not very, not a very, the next line, he's, they're lowering him down the wall in a basket. So, uh, you know, I think probably the Lord felt that, well, you need another little bit of humility there now, Saul. You're getting a little, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe the temptation is to become a little, you know, overweening. And so um, the Lord gives him a second uh, down-to-earth experience of humiliation, which is such a fruitful way, but not a very way we usually like. Just like I always think that, you know, the great line about humiliation, that um, when Winston Churchill won the war and then was booted out by the electorate, there's a great line in his uh, book, and I can't, I can't remember the exact wording, which with Churchill's important to get the right wording, but he said something, having defeated all the enemies of my nation and come to victory, the people dismissed me from office. And so he was very down that he got defeated. And his wife said to him, Winston, it's a blessing in disguise. And Churchill said, my dear, it's very heavily disguised. <laughs> so I think Saul, you know, after he leaves, after he's sort of starting to become a star preacher, he, he needs a little, a little basket trip out of the gates of Damascus anyway. Wow, what an amazing thing. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he journeyed, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight and inquire in the house of Judas for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, Something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and took food and was strengthened. For several days he was with the disciples at Damascus and in the synagogues immediately he proclaimed Jesus saying, he is the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called on this name? And he has come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests. But Saul increased all the more in strength 
and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.